Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Save Our Seas Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Lance. I am the Director of Environmental Sustainability at the Museum of Discovery and Science in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We're so happy to have you all here tonight. Um, we're also very, very happy to have our special distinguished speaker here tonight, Sophia Green, um, as uh, joining us actually all the way from the Galapagos Islands uh, tonight. So a uh, pretty special occasion. And to make it even more special, today is International Whale Shark Day. So happy International Whale Shark Day to everyone. Um, it's a very fitting uh, day because Sophia uh, is here tonight to talk to us all about, guess what, whale sharks, right? Um, tracking whale sharks, where do they go? And answering all kinds of really cool ecological questions um, about them. So uh, we will get started and, and introduce Sophia in a few moments. Um, I would like to um, just talk a little bit about what the museum does. For those of you that are uh, first time visitors uh, for our speaker series, uh, welcome, like I said. Um, the Museum of Discovery and Science is in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, our mission is to connect people to inspiring science. This is what we do day in and day out. And this speaker series is part of that. We are working with the Save Our Seas Foundation um, to highlight shark and ray and ocean conservation, education, research, um, and to share that with the world. Uh, so we have four strategic action pillars that we really focus on at the museum. Physical science education, early childhood education, health and wellness education, and environmental sustainability. So that's where I come in. I'm the, like I said, director of environmental sustainability. So um, this, uh, this speaker series and a lot of other um, initiatives um, go with that environmental sustainability pillar and all of those efforts. So let me introduce our very distinguished speaker tonight. Um, Sophia Green is a conservation biologist from Ecuador. Um, Galapagos, the Galapagos Islands have always been a part of her life. Thus, after graduating with a bachelor's degree in biology, she moved to the Galapagos Islands to work towards their conservation. She has been working in the Galapagos Islands since 2017 um, as, uh, sorry, as part of the Galapagos Whale Shark Project. Last year, Sophia graduated with an international master's degree in marine bio biological resources with a focus on concentration and ecology and continues to work with the um, Galapagos Whale Shark Project as a research assistant and data analyst. Besides her work with the project, she has been involved with other marine conservation projects on marine uh, invasive species, marine debris like plastics, uh, marine turtles conservation, and the uh, ecological monitoring of the Galapagos Arch uh, Archipelago with the Charles Darwin Foundation, and has also worked in, tr in the training of naturalists um, guides uh, of the archipelago with USFQ. Um, so without further ado, welcome, Sophia. Welcome to our speaker series. Are you there? <laughs> I'm here. Thank you so much, Lance, for that introduction. And thank yeah, you so much just, for providing to talk about whale We're sharks. so happy to have you. So just so everyone knows, um, Sophia is currently in the Galapagos, right? So um, she, has, she has told me that her internet connection there is not, uh, is to be desired, I guess. <laughs> so, um, Thank you. Uh, just we, it's, it's working really well right now, so we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, for anyone that um, has any questions for Sophia as we go tonight, make sure you type them into the chat. Um, we'll be feel free to ask questions throughout Sophia's presentation. She's going to be talking all about, all kind of all about whale sharks tonight, like I said, um, and um, we'll we'll have some question and answer session at the end as well. All right. Well, Sophia, I'll let you uh, take over. You can um, share your screen and um, introduce, introduce us to the wonderful world of whale sharks. Thank you so much, Lance, for that introduction. And it is seriously a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight, uh, today, talking about whale shark on International Whale Shark Day. It is we talk about this enigmatical and all the mysteries that surround it, and we, we use awareness 
so that we're able to go forward. Without further ado, I would like to share a presentation that I have prepared for all of you. Uh, so I will get started on that. Please let me know if you see my screen now. It's working on it. How's that? Can you see my screen? We got it. At least I got it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, I will actually turn off my video since we do have very iffy internet in the Galapagos Islands. So I'd rather you be able to hear and see the presentation. And I will turn on my video once we get back to the Q&A session. So without further ado, I would like to start talking to you guys about the Galapagos Whale Shark Project, specifically about how we're working on discovering the secrets of this ocean giant. First of all, I'm going to start with something very um, simple. A lot of times when people talk about whale sharks or they come up to us and ask us questions about whale sharks, they'll, they'll ask us, is the whale shark a whale or a shark? Or a lot of times people will say, oh, what about the whales you're studying? And we always start by mentioning that the whale shark is actually a shark. This individual is um, uh, has the same exact anatomy of the fish. It is the largest fish that have ever lived. And it is, uh, it, breathes through its gills. Therefore, the way that we study this animal is more so like you would any underwater breathing animal than any uh, surface breathing animal. Just a scientific classification, it is from the Orectolobiformis family, which is shared with other uh, shark species. It's most closely related relative are the zebra shark, nurse sharks, and uh, similar sharks but it is the only member of the Rincodontidae family, making it very unique and very interesting to study. What we know about whales is a lot less than what we don't know. It is the biggest shark in the ocean, and yet we know less about this fish than we know about other um, animal species, even like tiny ants in the, uh, on the earth. We know a lot less about this massive shark. What we do know about the shark is that it is the largest fish and shark to have probably ever have lived, even longer than the um, extinct Megalodon, reaching 18 to 20 meters long and can weigh up to 20 tons. Just so that you understand more or less what this is, it is about the weight of four adult elephants put together. So it's a massive animal. We also know that it is a filter feeding shark and it can suction up to 600,000 liters per hour, feeding on the smallest individuals on the ocean. These are zooplankton, fish, coral eggs, and very, very small fish and even squids. A lot of people ask us, is it dangerous to humans? And we say, absolutely not. Even though it can suction this amount of water, its throat is about the size of a baseball. Therefore, even if for any reason you would be suctioned in, there is no way that this animal could swallow you. A lot of people think that the whale shark no longer has teeth. However, it has hundreds of rows of tiny, tiny teeth that work that no longer serve a purpose or sit to your appendix and serve as a vestigial structure in the whale shark. What we all know about whale sharks, the tiny bit we know about the region, is that they are oviviparous or sac with parity. What this means is that they give life young. In difference to other shark species who lay eggs and leave them on the bottom of the ocean and leave, whale sharks actually do give birth to individuals, to, to neonates about 45 centimeters long. Even though there is no parental care, this is, um, they do give birth to life young. We also know that they can dive to at least 2,000 meters deep. And why do I say at least? We'll talk about this further, but basically the deepest dive recorded has been about of 1,928 meters. And it is only the deepest dive recorded by the technological limitations that we have now. Unfortunately, the tags that we use to record their diving behavior do not surpass this kind of depth. They will implode at depths beneath 1,800, 1,900 meters. And therefore, we don't truly know how deep a whale shark can go, but we know that they can go to around two kilometers in depth. Whale sharks are also fascinating because they are found all over the world. They have a circumglobal distribution between tropical and temperate water latitudes. They actually enjoy warm water, which make them the perfect species to study for people like me who do not enjoy cold waters. <laughs> so they do enjoy temperatures that range between 
23 degrees, more or less, all the way up to 30 degrees. So they like very, very warm waters. They are found in all of the seas of the world, except for the Mediterranean. But even as I say this to you right now, I have to mention that only a couple months ago, they were sighted for the first time in the Mediterranean. Whether this was a single sighting or whether this was um, a new occurrence that may be happening due to climate change and a changing ocean, we do not know yet, but they are conquering the world. They are solitary creatures that travel the world's oceans and only tend to aggregate in certain areas, usually for food availability. So when they're feeding, they aggregate in huge numbers, and these are the coastal areas where people see them around the world. Most of the aggregations you see marked on this map are of juvenile males, whereas we don't really know where the adult females spend a lot of their time, nor whether where the adult males spend a lot of the time. That's why there is a lot that we do not know about whale sharks. They're hard to reach, they're in faraway places, and we only see them when they're in coastal aggregations. What we don't know about whale sharks is a lot. It's their global population size, where they're reproducing, where are the pups born, where they spend the first three to five years of their life. We do not fully understand their migratory routes and how the different populations around the oceans connect, and we don't fully understand their diving behavior. So all of these are the questions that we're asking, and we want to figure out if we have to have any hope of protecting this whale shark from extinction. But why does this all matter? Why go out and look for these animals, spend thousands of dollars on expeditions to look for this animal? Besides that it has its inherent right to live, we also, um, we, we care about this animal because it has been downgraded from vulnerable to endangered in 2016. And it has been downgraded in this matter because of human impacts. The whale shark's future is uncertain. It suffers a plethora of human threats. These, the top human threats it suffers, are incidental and targeted fisheries, specifically these industrial fisheries where whale sharks fall prey as bycatch. Then we have vessel strikes, because even though whale sharks can die very deep, we know that they spend around 50% of their time in very, very shallow waters, so they're uh, encountering vessels. We know that they suffer from marine pollution like plastics and oil spills, and we know that they, they are changing their distributions due to climate change. And climate change is one of the problems that makes us fear the most. Why? Because we have high uncertainty of how climate change is going to affect their migratory patterns. So we're trying to protect ocean areas where whale sharks live, but we do not know exactly how this distribution is going to change. So how do we protect whale sharks when, when we don't know where they're going to be in the future? In only 75 years, the global whale shark population has been reduced by 50% due to these threats. And we don't have to go very far to see these threats and to see exactly what's happening to these sharks. In 2021, we went out and we tagged eight whale sharks. From these eight whale sharks, three of eight tags reported on land. That's around 40%. Almost half the number of whale sharks that we tagged suddenly started pinging on land. And for us, this was wild. You know, the whale, the whale sharks only give signal when they're fin, when their tag is out of water. So to suddenly see them reporting from land, two started reporting from fishing towns in Ecuador and one from fishing town in Peru, was very shocking to us. We do not know exactly what may have happened to these three individuals that started reporting in August of, um, in October of 2021, November of 2022, and January of 2020, uh, 22 but we know that there was a definite encounter with uh, some vessel, some human encounter for their tags to have ended up on land. We do not know if the whale sharks actually ended up on land as well, but still the threat has been highlighted. Also, the effects of marine pollution are being seen worldwide. First of all, this is a filter feeding species. And as I mentioned a little while ago, they filter in massive amounts of liquid every time that they need to feed. So by doing so, they're sucking in everything in the water column. And one of the biggest problems we have now in our ocean is tiny, tiny fragments of plastic that are everywhere in the water column that are going through the system of our marine animals and they are affecting their digestion 
We also have the problem of fishing nets, discarded ghost nets that are entangling our wildlife. And so this is a huge problem. Last year, we also had the problem, we also had this insane encounter in the island of Darwin. We were out doing our research and we found we encountered this whale shark with a giant fishing net entangled in its pectoral fin. This fishing net was actually cutting into the, door, the pectoral fin of this whale shark. Fortunately, we were able to see it and Jonathan Green, my father, was able to approach it and had a knife in his pocket and was able to cut this net off of the whale shark as you see in this video. As he pulled it off, he said he tried lifting this out of the water, but because it had been underwater for so long and was covered in barnacles, it was so incredibly heavy, it was impossible to take out of the ocean. But at least he was able to cut it off the whale shark and there it goes, the net unfortunately went down into the depths of the ocean, but the whale shark swam free and must have been so relieved to not have that weight, um, to not be carrying that weight that was cutting into her skin. So this was a success story, but how many whale sharks and how many other marine wildlife go through this and do not have the same luck, the same fate as this whale shark did. As I mentioned, we have the problem of vessel strikes. There was a study that was released at the beginning of this year that shows just how high the probability of a vessel striking a whale shark is. Here you can see the general movements and general areas where whale sharks move, and then you can also see the high density of vessel traffic. Every single day we have an increasing amount of boats traveling uh, through the oceans where, where it may be for tourism, it may be for um, transportation, cargo, Every single day we have more boats moving across the world's oceans, creating this insane net of never ending um, probability of impact. The study actually found out that 92% of the horizontal space and 50% of the vertical space overlaps with the roots of large vessels. So whale sharks are highly likely to get impacted. I'd like you to take a minute to look at the head of this whale shark. This is a whale shark we encountered in Darwin Island in 2019 and she was missing an entire chunk of her head. It was like if somebody had cut a piece of cheese from the whale shark's head. Thank God whale sharks have a very tiny brain. So even this massive 50 meter long individual, its brain is about the size of my palm, a little bit bigger than a walnut. So it did not actually reach her brain, but it did do a lot of damage. Once again, this was a lucky individual that managed to survive this impact but how many do we never even see with the scars because they do not make it, uh, um, they do not survive the encounter. Then we have a couple other problems like the use of fish fins for, for um, fit and soup in the Asian market. Other people like the fins for trophies. And then something that is very important to mention because we may all be contributing to is the use of a lasmobranch or shark cartilage in medicines to help joints. So if you, if you have arthritis or if you play sports and have some joint issue, you may be buying any, some sort of medicine to help your joints. And it is very important for you to read the labels and make sure that it doesn't say anything like chondrichthion, elasmobranch, or some people are even proud to use the word shark on it. Um, so we don't contribute to this ourselves. But once again, I ask you all, why is this important? Besides the whale shark being endangered and having this inherent right to live, it is also highly important ecologically and economically for our world. For our oceans, it is highly important ecologically because it travels huge distances. So it moves from nutrient rich areas to nutrient poor areas. And as it does so, it takes nutrients from these areas uh, it transports nutrients from the high density nutrient areas to low nutrient areas. So it feeds in areas with high nutrients, defecates in areas with no nutrients, and brings sprouts life in areas in the ocean that would have not had life otherwise. The whale shark also naturally mitigates the effects of climate change through carbon sequestration. Every single one of us, every single live being is made up of carbon. And the bigger you are, the bigger carbon you carry in your body. So having this massive animal underwater that has so much carbon in its body 
when they die, they sink to the bottom and they take out this amount of carbon from the atmosphere, out of the atmosphere for centuries. So this is a way to naturally mitigate carbon. No, climate change. Whale sharks also regulate the levels of zooplankton and phytoplankton in the oceans. And this is highly, highly important because we live off of the oxygen provided by phytoplankton. For us, it is in, we 90, sorry, 50% and more of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the world's oceans. So we need these individuals that help produce the oxygen to be able to survive. Whale sharks are also highly important economically. Why so? Well, people travel from all over the world to get to see this animal underwater for even a few seconds. So it helps maintain coastal population economies through tourism. When a tourist travels to a place like the Galapagos, for example, to go on a dive liverboard and see a whale shark, they're not only spending money on the dive liverboard. They may also spend money in hotels, restaurants, buying souvenirs, and all of this helps the coastal populations. In that manner, a live whale shark can produce over two, about $2 million in its lifetime versus a single fin that is being sold in the black market for about $20,000. This means that a live whale shark is worth a lot more alive than it is dead. Something else that I absolutely love about whale sharks is that they are an umbrella species. And because of this, they serve as ocean ambassadors. And by protecting the whale sharks, we're protecting marine life in general. You see, because they are highly charismatic and people care about whale sharks a lot more than they may care about other individuals, other uh, marine animals, for example, serpulid worms. If we study whale sharks and protect ocean areas where the whale sharks live, which are huge ocean areas, we're also protecting other endangered species of sharks, rays, turtles, coral reefs, and everything else that lives in the same ocean areas. Now, what is the Galapagos whale shark and what are we doing with this individual here in this region of the world? First of all, I'd like to introduce the project members. Uh, the Galapagos whale shark project was founded by Jonathan Green and Dr. Alex Hearn in 2011 and has since grown into a big project of a team of scientists from all over the world that meet a couple of times a year to research whale sharks in the Galapagos. We have scientists from Ecuador, Germany, Spain, New Zealand, Switzerland, Japan, England. So it's a beautiful team of scientists that have come together to work on the preservation, conservation of the species. The Galapagos Whale Shark Project has a very important objective. That is to gather as much information as we can about the species, to take it then to the government and to policymakers to improve the management practices both within the Galapagos Marine Reserve and the rest of the Eastern Tropical Pacific. It was created in 2011 and since then carries out yearly expeditions to study the species in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. So at least once or twice a year, we go out to Darwin Island to study the enigmatic whale shark. The research that we do on every single expedition is as follows. We carry out satellite tagging, photo identification, run ultrasounds, we take blood samples and we take tissue samples. Our main study site is Darwin's Arch. And here I want to show you an image. I don't know how many of you have been to Darwin's Arch or have heard of Darwin's Arch. But here on the left, we have an image of what Darwin Island used to look like a year ago. Then here in the center, we have an image of a collapsed Darwin's Arch. When the Arch of Darwin collapsed, everyone was in shock. It reached international media and even divers and non-divers alike were very sad to have not seen this beautiful structure that towers over the most amazing dive site, one of the most amazing dive sites of the world. What I'd like people to think about is that geological collapse is very natural, but ecological collapse, which is happening right beneath the surface of those same waves is not. And that is what should be captured capturing international attention and should be shared all over the media. We use this dive site because of its amazing topography. So here in, the, here in Darwin's Arch, I'd like you to observe right in the corner of the center part of at the right, that is Darwin's Arch right next to Darwin's Island. 
And it is this dive site that has the amazing topography that drops down from 15 meters to 100 plus in the matter of, of 100 horizontal meters. So in very little space, we have this incredible drop off and we're in the middle of the ocean. What this allows us to see is oceanic pelagic animals that are not seen anywhere near coastal sites because we have to be out in the open ocean to be able to see them. And that is why in the Galapagos, we have a very unique population of 99% adult females, not seen anywhere else in the world in this ratio. As I mentioned earlier, everywhere else in the world where you see whale sharks, you're gonna be seeing juvenile males. But here we have the chance of studying these adults, females, which are the most important in regards to reproduction and keeping the species alive. They are sighted seasonally every year between June and December up in Darwin Island. Because we want to be able to protect them, we have to know exactly which ocean areas they're using. And for that reason, we're using satellite tagging. In the last 10 years, over 100 whale sharks have been tagged in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And you can see in this map on this slide how when the whale sharks leave Darwin Island, they don't follow a track, a, a track from point A to point B. Instead, they leave the island and scatter around all around the eastern tropical Pacific and even further. And for us scientists, that makes it really hard to know exactly which ocean areas to protect. So now we're looking at how do whale sharks migrate? How do they find their way in the ocean? And what influences their movements the most? Is it sea surface temperature, lunar phases? Is it their food availability? So all of that is what we're looking into to be able to protect the most important ocean areas that whale sharks use. The tagging methodology the project used has evolved a lot over the past years. Initially, we used to use these pressure guns to insert a tow tag, subcutaneous tag, uh, into the whale shark. There's two reasons why we mainly changed this tagging methodology. First of all, it looked invasive. Even though it was never a problem to insert this little anchor inside the skin of a whale shark, it looked very invasive. However, whale sharks have one of the thickest skins of any animal in the animal kingdom, and therefore it was never an actual problem. However, Besides it looking invasive, we also had the problem that they were toe tags. So as you see in the first image at the bottom, we have this long tether and then the tag was floating right by the whale shark. The problem was with this was that we're tagging them in one of the sharkiest waters in the world. And because there are so many other shark species around, they would see this little tag floating next to whale shark and they would think it was something interesting, something yummy. They would hit it, and in the matter of minutes, we would lose $4,000, $5,000. Therefore, we have changed to fin mount pressure clamp tags, as you can see in the next image. And this type of methodology is a lot less invasive. It takes a very little time. We simply approach the shark, place the clamp, and also we're not uh, losing as many to associated species. So we're having a higher um, retention rate. Great, higher success rate. I'd like to show you a small clip of how this tagging is actually achieved. So here you see uh, one of our researchers approaching a whale shark, opening the fin clamp, placing it on the tip of the dorsal of the whale shark, letting go, and that is it. That happened in less than 30 seconds. And that's it, the whale shark is tagged, it didn't even feel a thing, and it keeps going on its way. Simultaneously, our other team member just took a photo of the right side of the whale shark and is moving over to the left side of the whale shark to snap a photo parallel of the side of the body for photo ID. And I'll go more into detail about photo identification. Before I do so, I'd like to talk about a couple other tags that we're experimenting with. Yes? Uh, I was gonna say, uh, ask a question about, uh, that, that seemed pretty easy, Guns. but you left out the, the key detail that these sharks are moving really fast, right? <laughs> uh, you, must, you must get some, um, some good cardio they are. workout. Thank you for mentioning. <laughs> trying to keep up with them, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. This, this is, I, I love that we mentioned that because for us, it's very funny. For when you see a whale shark moving in the water, they look like they're moving very gently, very slowly. But they have these massive, massive tails that actually 
make them move so fast in the water column that when you're trying to catch up with a whale shark, you physically see, visibly see how the manometer with your pressure, your air pressure starts declining. And you see it dropping and dropping and dropping. You're consuming air as fast as possible. You're trying to reach the whale shark. So reaching it is actually the hardest part. <laughs> Once we're by the whale shark, we have a strategy. Don't block the whale shark's path. We always kind of go over the whale shark so we don't disturb it. And then we slowly let it like move right beneath us and we open the fin clamp and put it on. So it is definitely a cardio workout. It's, it's something that, uh, yeah, we definitely had to train in. <laughs> Thank <laughs> right. you for mentioning that. The short dive times <laughs> suck up all your air. <laughs> exactly. Short dive times are learning how to retain air very, very well. <laughs> right. So... Moving on to the deep tag that we're using, this is also very interesting because I mentioned earlier that the, the whale sharks dive up to around 1,928 meters or up to two kilometers deep. We know that this is just what the technology is telling us, but not necessarily the real depth that whale sharks can reach. So we're developing alongside the Georgia Aquarium, we're trying to develop this deep tag to be able to see how deep they can really go. Unfortunately, the tag is still in trial. Uh, times we're, we're, we're working on it but it's supposed to be able to read depths up to 4,000 maybe even 6,000 meters uh, beneath the surface of the ocean so once this is properly uh, working we hope to see exactly how deep they can go another really cool tag that we're using is the cat scam tags that give us accelerometers and also give us a camera tag which allows us to see the secret life of whale sharks, if you may, of what happens underwater when we're not around. And what these cameras have captured is something very interesting, which I want to share with you. As you can see, other shark species are using the whale shark as a live scratching board. There you go. There's a couple of silky sharks, black tip reef sharks, Galapagos sharks, rubbing themselves against the, the scales of the whale shark. And we believe they may be doing this to actually get rid of parasites on their own skin. You see the skin of a shark, of any shark species, including the whale shark, is actually very, 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 um, it's like a thousand blades. If you touch it in one direction, the dermal denticles or scales that make up the skin are very smooth. But if you touch it the wrong direction, it's like a thousand knives. So they use the whale shark like a life scratching board to get rid of the parasites. So without these camera tags, we would have never known these sharks are doing this with the whale shark. It's incredible to find this kind of symbiotic relationship. I wonder what the whale shark thinks of that. <laughs> you can see it those... kind of shaking in the video, so it doesn't seem to love it, but I don't think right. it can do much about it. <laughs> How long can those camera tags, how long do they stay attached? So those camera tags, we actually have to get back. It's not the same as the satellite tag, which we leave on the whale shark, the whale shark disappears, and then it starts sending image. The camera tags, we actually have to get back. So we place them with um, these galvanic attachments that actually corrode in very limited hours. So we'll uh, place them for three hours maybe even six hours if we're feeling risky that day and then we have to actually go and search for these camera tags once they release out in open ocean with a vhf antenna and it's a lot harder than you would believe just finding this kind of tiny orange device in the ocean is a very very difficult feat so we're trying to work with the redundancy adding different ways that we can uh, find these tags we're adding little lights we're adding other satellites attached to them to be able to find them because it's really hard to find them and they cost a lot of money. So yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Moving on to photo ID. Um, I like photo ID most of all because it is a way of passive tracking. Satellite tags are a way of active tracking. However, we need to be able, we can't tag every single whale shark out there. However, a lot of people now take cameras underwater and a lot of people like to take pictures of the whale sharks that they see. 
The patterns on each whale shark are in, are unique to each individual. They're like your thumbprint or like the swirls on a polar bear's face or like the spot patterns on a cheetah's skin. They allow us to identify each animal as an individual. So what we do is we use these photos, we upload them to a global catalog, and we analyze these spot patterns to see if this individual has ever been seen before. And this allows us to see if the animal has uh, been sighted before here in the Galapagos, if it's been sighted elsewhere in the world, it allows us to look at population parameters like residency, mortality, um, how often they return. So it's actually very, very um, beneficial to study this species using this methodology. In the Galapagos, we've identified over 600 individuals. And what we found out is very interesting. Initially, they thought it was the same whale sharks kind of returning and turning around Galapagos. However, now we know that almost every single individual that crosses is unique because we rarely, rarely have a resighting. However, when we do, it's very exciting. We've seen that some whale sh sharks have returned after four years of their first sighting, nine years, 12 years. And this year, we had a very, very exciting resighting of 13.5 years. So this whale shark that you can see was sighted first in 2008 and then in 2022, which allows us to see she is alive and well and has been able to avoid all the plethora of human threats. So, so it's always um, a very welcome surprise when we see a resighting like this. However, for us, photo identification is also really important because we can involve citizens as conservationists in our projects. Citizens like any of you listening to this uh, presentation right now can go out diving, encounter a whale shark, and if you take a photo, you can actually upload it to the shark book, the global catalog of whale sharks, and can help scientists reveal a lot more about their movements, about their life story. Here we have an amazing success story of two citizens that went diving, one in Socorro, Mexico, in Revilla Gigedo Archipelago, saw a whale shark and uploaded a photo. A year later, we had a diver come dive on a liverboard in the Galapagos Islands, saw a whale shark in the south of the archipelago in Isabella Islands, uploaded a photo, and when we ran the spot pattern mapping, we saw that there was a match. We did not even know that there was a connectivity between Mexico and Ecuador. And thank you to citizens helping scientists and helping conservation projects we have this amazing story of a whale shark moving from Mexico all the way to the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador in about a year. So the real power of citizen science is, is this. Us as scientists can only be out in the open ocean maybe two weeks a year studying these animals, maybe for a lucky three or four weeks a year. However, we have divers in the water in these places every single day sighting these animals. So any of you can go out and help conservation. If you do wish to help us out, just know that this is the area that we use behind the last gill slit and at the end of the pectoral fin to uh, analyze the spot patterns of each whale shark. The left side works best, right side we will take as well. And if you get both sides, we'll love you forever. <laughs> then we also look at the scars. Scars are an amazing identifying uh, feature, like you see on, on this whale shark. It had a massive, massive bite, probably from a great white shark. Um, luckily, it had survived the encounter. So scars help us identify whale sharks. Then we look at the fins. Fins usually have some raggedy bits, some chopped bits. So that also helps us identify. And then full body shots are always helpful. The necessary info that we need besides your photo is the date that you saw the whale shark, the location where you saw it. And then if you have extra information like the estimated size, the water temperature and sex are always very, very welcome. Next, I'd like to tell you a little oh, bit about Of course. What if, what what if we spot ahead. whale sharks in, in the Atlantic Ocean? Do you still take those sightings too? Absolutely. We're working worldwide with everyone studying whale sharks. It's an amazing collaborative community of scientists. So we're working worldwide with everyone. And it doesn't matter where you are, the Wild Book for Whale Sharks is a global catalog and we'll upload them. And for us, it's amazing to know which populations connect with which. So the more whale sharks we have from different spots on our earth, the better um, our 
our sampling will be for sure. Very nice. Next on ultrasounds, uh, we're the first team running ultrasounds on free swimming wild whale sharks. And this is because it's not an easy feat to accomplish. But the reason why we're doing this is because very, very little is known about whale shark reproduction. The only thing we know about the reproductive life cycle is from a female that was captured in Taiwan in 1995. This female had 304 pups inside of her. And the coolest thing, I mean, that's already wild, <laughs> but the coolest thing was that all these pups were in different stages of development. Some were already about 45, 50 centimeters long, ready to be born, and others were tiny, tiny individuals individuals still in development and others were still inside the egg cases inside the reproductive system of the whale shark. However, when they sampled these uh, pups genetically, they found out that all of them were from the same male, which may go to show why we hardly ever see adult female whale sharks and adult male whale sharks together. If they only need to meet once to produce 304 pups, then they don't have to meet very often. And what what we believe that the female whale shark is capable of doing is somehow delaying fertilization, so storing the semen and slowly, slowly fertilizing her eggs so that all her pups are born at different times to provide a higher chance of survival. In the Galapagos, as I mentioned, we have 99% adult female whale sharks with this large distended abdomen, not seen in many other places. So when scientists saw this, they thought, what could this mean? Are they pregnant? So of course, this was the main hypothesis running and we had to do something about it. We had to figure out if these whale sharks were truly pregnant. For that reason, we partnered with a team from the Okinawa Churaomi Aquarium in Japan. They were using this incredible underwater ultrasound machine on their juvenile sharks, whale sharks in the aquarium in Japan. And we called them up and said, would you mind coming over, bringing your machine and helping us scan these animals in the wild? And so they said, yes, we'd love to do it. It would be amazing to try. It'd be amazing to find out if these whale sharks in the wild are pregnant. So in 2017, the team from Japan flew over and I'm going to tell you a funny story. When they arrived, we had told them that it's almost 100% guaranteed to see these whale sharks between June and November, whale shark season, prime whale shark season. So they fly all the way, 2017, uh, La Nina year. It's a very, very cold year. We go diving, first day, no whale shark. Second day, no whale sharks. Third day, no whale sharks. So they're starting to despair. They're, they're starting to panic. The research was almost coming to an end. And, Finally, 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 on the fourth or fifth day of diving, a huge massive whale shark starts appearing in the blue. They prepare the ultrasound, turn it on, zoom to the whale shark. I mean, it's already hard when, when you're not carrying a 17 kilogram machine. They manage to zoom to the whale shark, start scanning. And the minute they get down close and under, they see two giant claspers, meaning it was an adult male. <laughs> so... What was the probability in Galapagos? Quite literally 1%. <laughs> so unfortunately, that was the first male whale shark that was ever, uh, the first adult whale shark that was ever ultrasounded in the wild. Luckily, a couple other females did appear during that trip, but we found out that the ultrasound machine was too weak. Because whale shark skin is so, so thick, they have about 30 centimeters of only dermis. So the ultrasound machine was actually too weak to look into the reproductive system. <laughs> so they came back in 2018 with a super powered machine and they were able to finally run successful scans of whale sharks, a reproductive system. And what they found was quite the opposite of what everyone was expecting. We did not see any signs of pregnancy, but we did see mature follicles, as you can see in this image. For us, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that whale sharks are not um, pregnant at another time, another stage in the Galapagos, which is why this is an ongoing study. They came here during a later time of the year. We're hoping uh, that our teammates will be able to come back after uh, certain COVID restrictions open up in and so we want to continue with some of the females in Galapagos are pregnant. 
simultaneously to the ultrasounds, we're also uh, obtaining blood samples. We want to obtain the blood samples to be able to look at the hormone levels. It really knows what the hormone levels would be for a pregnant whale shark. So we need to get a positive ultrasound scan and a positive uh, and a blood sample from the same shark to eventually know what the hormone levels would be for a pregnant whale shark. And in the future, we would be able to see only with the blood sample if the, the female that we're observing is pregnant or is not pregnant. Besides that, we're also running uh, studies on the impact of science and tourism on whale sharks. And we use the blood samples, we take them immediately after we draw the blood in the water, we take it back on board, analyze it with our ISTAT machine and look at, at lactic acid levels. So after we worked on this whale shark, tagged it, drawn blood, taken photo ID, we want to see what the lactic acid levels are to make sure that we're not stressing the animals. It is very, very important for us to know that tourism nor science is affecting whale shark behavior. And I'm happy, happy to report that to this day, we have not had any signs of stress on any of the animals we have sampled. Just to wrap up, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, three whale sharks with a story. We have Hope, Nemo, and Coco. Hope was a whale shark that we tagged in 2019. She was a juvenile whale shark rare sighting in the Galapagos Islands. She was a juvenile whale shark about seven meters long that we tapped. And this amazing whale shark set out on this amazing ocean journey, went all the way out to the west, thousands of kilometers away, and then started turning around towards the Galapagos archipelago. Seeing that she was coming back, we thought, oh my gosh, she's gonna be the first whale shark that we're able to track leaving the Galapagos Islands and then returning to the Galapagos Islands. So we named her Hope. However, in 2020, in May of 2020, from one day to the next, Hope stopped transmitting. And for us, initially it didn't mean anything because as I mentioned earlier, sharks don't breathe on the surface. So they disappear beneath the surface of the ocean for a while. However, after her tag had not transmitted for a while, we started getting a little worried and we looked at her last transmission. And her last transmission showed three things. One, it showed the tag was showing perfect satellite um, data. It, it showed high quality data, which usually happens only when the shark, the satellite tag is fully out of water for quite a long time or if it, or, or if it has been taken off the shark. The next thing we saw was that the tag was traveling at a speed the whale sharks cannot reach. It was traveling at a nine knot speed when whale sharks can barely, barely reach five knots when they're actually racing in the ocean, like running from a predator or swimming away from a predator. So we saw that this was definitely not the shark's natural movement. And the last thing we saw was that she stopped pinging in an area with high fishing pressure. These white dots that you see underlaid under her track are the fishing pressure seen from the Global Fishing Watch. We may never know what happened truly to Hope, but we can only assume that she was caught in, by an industrial fishing fleet. And that is the reason why she stopped transmitting. For us to see this was actually heartbreaking. It was a whale shark that we had seen, we had tagged, we cared deeply about every single one of the whale sharks that we work with, and we had hoped to see her again. And instead, we lost her signal, and her, her fate was probably not what we would have wished. Maybe because it was during the pandemic that this happened, or maybe because we were already sharing the story about this whale shark with a name that was going to return to Galapagos, it caught a lot of people's attention. And the good thing about what happened to Hope, if there's any, anything positive to pull out of this, was that it created a lot of media attention. People were devastated. They drew pictures of her. They wrote songs about her. Pictures. She was all over the media nationally and internationally. And what we like telling people is that the story of Hope is not the story of a single whale shark. Instead, it is a story of hundreds of thousands of sharks and other endangered marine species that suffer the same fate every single day in our oceans. Moving on to our happier version, Nemo was a whale shark tagged one year later. 
and Nemo made history. She did exactly what we hoped the hope would do. She left the Darwin Island and after an amazing 80 day journey of 1,600 kilometers, she actually returned to Darwin Island, showing us the importance of this area for whale sharks and achieving this complete migratory track. Next, we have Coco. She was a whale shark tagged also in um, Darwin Island on 2020, right after COVID quarantine. And she did an amazing, amazing thing. We had already been looking at this, um, this migratory corridor between Darwin Island and then Cocos Island in Costa Rica, between Ecuador and Costa Rica, and seen that it was very important for a lot of migratory species. Different species of sharks like hammerheads and silky sharks were moving in between these two protected areas. Turtles were moving in between these two protected areas. Marine mammals were moving in between these two protected areas. And they were losing protection when traveling from one to the other right in the middle. So we had identified this as an important area. And then we had Coco move from Darwin Island directly through the migratory corridor to the Cocos Island. This highlighted once again how important this area was for endangered species traveling the, or the ocean. Here you can see a map of all the different species that use this network, not only from uh, Galapagos and Ecuador to Cocos Island, but to other marine protected areas in Colombia, Panama, and Mexico. Thanks to the information provided by our project and by so many more that are tracking these marine endangered species, migratory megafauna, our government shared the greatest, um, we had the, the best success story at the beginning of this year. A new marine protected area was created by a government and the declaration was signed on the 14th of January of 2022, which protected this exact marine corridor between uh, Ecuador Island, uh, Ecuador territory and Costa Rican territory to protect the species moving through this migratory corridor in this area of the ocean. Next, I just want to show you a quick map of the whale sharks that we tagged in the expedition of July in 2022. These are the animals that we are currently tracking. They're showing beautiful, beautiful tracks and we can't wait to see what else they show us. And last, I want to tell you about a new study and where our project is moving towards in the future. In the past, like I mentioned, we've been working primarily at Darwin Island. This is the area where we have our seasonal sightings where we know whale sharks appear every single year. And we didn't exactly know if whale sharks were around the rest of the year. However, during the last maybe couple of years, we've heard a lot of reports from dive guides, fishermen, park rangers, saying that they've been seeing whale sharks in the south of the archipelago during the warm season. So during the months of January to June. And knowing that these whale sharks may be in some part of the southern archipelago, we decided to go check it out. However, we don't have a specific dive site where we can just drop into and study these animals. It's a huge ocean area that we have to cover. So how can we find these animals? We've created a collaboration with Ecuador Bajo Mis Alas, so this ultralight aircraft that is helping us with a bird's eye view of the ocean to find the whale sharks. And what we do is we travel on a fisherman's boat in the ocean, the spotter plane flies above us and circles around the ocean area where we are. And when they find a whale shark, they'll radio down to us and let us know exactly where she is. And once we reach the ocean area, they radio down and go 10 meters to your left. Now two meters in front, now jump in now. So we all jump into the water without a tap. There's no chance of using scuba diving here. So with one deep breath of air, we sink down into the ocean. We always jump a little further away from the whale shark so that we're not jumping on top of it and then swim down to it. And with one single breath of air, we have to tag the whale shark, take the photo ID and check if this is a male or a female. This, in, this part of our research is very exciting because it's gonna help us solve and fill in a missing puzzle piece that we did not have before. First of all, it's amazing to find this new aggregation, new constellation of whale sharks in the south of the archipelago. And second of all, it might help us answer where these whale sharks are during this time of the year. If they are the same whale sharks we then see in the, during the cold season up in the far northern region of the archipelago in Darwin Island, and what we want to look at as well, if there are any differences in behavior, if there are any males involved, if they may be feeding in this area. 
So it's, it's helping us connect um, the, or fill in this missing puzzle piece, which is very exciting for us. None of this work would be possible without all of our collaborators, donors, project partners. So a huge thank you to all of them. And then a huge thank you to all of you who are here with us this afternoon during International Whale Shark Day, talking about whale sharks with me. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer any of them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, that was so amazing with such great information. Um, back in the, the beginning of the, your presentation, I love when the idea of using a whale shark conservation as a carbon sequestration. <laughs> that's, that's such a fun idea, right? Um, it's an it's a, uh, interesting thing to, to talk about. Thank you very much for all your wonderful information. I really do appreciate it. Um, for those of you uh, still on, please stick around. Like I said, we have some time for questions. So if you have any questions you would like to ask Sophia, um, please, um, please go ahead and type them into the chat. Um, we will uh, ask away. I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, Absolutely. So... So well, there's there's a lot of things. I was taking notes as you were as you were writing stuff down, um, and there's a, there's a lot of really interesting points that that you were making. Like the, the economic impact of a live whale shark is huge, and I can imagine that's not just for whale sharks in the Galapagos. That's also for whale sharks off the coast of Mexico, whale sharks off the coast of Florida, right? Um, exactly. So that's a that's a really cool thing, and um, is 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 that something? I guess that uh, and with your research, the Ecuadorian government has taken note of and is trying to to promote. I know you you show you showed a few of those fishing maps, and there's look like right outside of the marine protected area, there's really heavy fishing, right? Um, so, is there any effort to talk to these talk to the fisher uh, the fishing community to I don't know maybe promote more conservation and education? Um, in that way instead. Thank you for the question. That's very interesting. Um, there's absolute interest in the government in protecting these migratory uh, species. Um, they have been very open in taking the data scientists provide. That's why we've managed to have this great success of creating the new marine reserve. So that's been wonderful. But a lot more work has to be done with the community. So inside the marine reserve, we're already trying to involve fishermen in our studies. We now hire fishermen vessels to go out on our research. So they provide the, the, the vessel for us. They're part of the expedition. They're part of the science. So we're trying to involve the community as much as possible with the science so that they realize how connected these marine individuals are to their own life. Because a lot of time without education and outreach, you don't realize how these marine creatures or how ocean life is connected to your life personally if you haven't had the privilege or the the access to spending time in the ocean or knowing about this so we're working a lot more in education and outreach involving the community and then we are trying to work a lot more with our government unfortunately what you mentioned about that high high level of fishing impact right outside the galapagos marine reserve that is very difficult to control because it is an area in the high seas. So it is an area without any kind of laws. Unfortunately, the, the law of the ocean, the UNCLOS, mm -hmm. has to be reformed in order to be able to protect this. And there are uh, ongoing negotiations happening right now with our world leaders, so fingers crossed, they change this lawless area of the ocean to have some laws and we're able to protect and preserve this because they are hitting the areas right as our migratory species leave a marine protected area and then lose all kind of protection. Right. Yeah, it's a difficult, difficult problem, right? Um, as you could say, as you said, it's an area free of law, oftentimes, right? Um, that's interesting. Um, well, I so when I think of what you do um, as a whale shark researcher, it see, it seems like you hit the jackpot of shark research right um i i've I'm, ever since i was in middle school i wanted to be a, a shark biologist you know i remember watching um shark week on the discovery channel and be like oh that's what i want to do and 
you know, things, things change, um, as we go, but it seems like you, you really, you got the, you got the jackpot. Um, your, your job seems really amazing. So, um, that's really cool. So if someone is, is interested in following this career path, um, get, could you highlight how did, how did you get involved studying whale sharks? Um, how did you find yourself in the Galapagos and maybe how could a young person or, or an older person, doesn't matter. You can always career change, right? Um, how could they get onto this this path to, to studying sharks in general or studying whale sharks specifically? Absolutely. Um, well, I'm a firm believer in that you can make things happen for yourself if you truly want them. Um, if you have to work hard and be willing to put yourself in situations where you don't always have the perfect job from the beginning. So initially, when I started working in biology or marine conservation, I had to take, first of all, volunteering positions where I worked in something that wasn't exactly what I wanted at first. So I was taking any volunteering position that would let me die, that would let me have experience working in the ocean. And at the same time, taking side jobs, say, as a waitress, you know. So it's not that this job just magically comes into your hand. You have to be willing to work for it. And then what I recommend people do is just exposing themselves to as many experiences as possible. So if you have the opportunity to dive as much as possible, and I know it's expensive, but you volunteer at a scuba diving facility if, if you can't afford to do it otherwise you can volunteer in exchange for dives you can put yourself out there with as many projects just yeah make sure that you're in the environment you want to work with i was very very lucky in the sense that the galapagos was always a part of my life my parents arrived to the galapagos islands um, over 30 years ago so they were among the first people on these islands these islands have a very very short history of people living on them so we were very lucky to have them they were scientists as well my dad's geologist and the person that founded the galapagos whale shark project and my mom is a marine biologist and they both were part of the conservation of the galapagos islands so it was always something we talked about you know at the table we spent half of our life here in the galapagos so for for me it was like i want to study biology and I'm seeing the impacts of what's going on and I want to be a part of the protection of the Galapagos Islands. So I came here, worked in a lot of different jobs initially. And then thankfully with uh, my dad's work, he actually managed to one year invite me to join one of the expeditions. And then I was like, wow, I found what I want to do. This is amazing. Studying with whale sharks is not only about whale shark protection, it's about marine conservation, which I absolutely loved. And yeah, since then I've been trapped, <laughs> happily right. trapped in this job. <laughs> nice. I like, I like that uh, the message of just try it, try it, right? Try everything. You never know where where you're going to lead, right? So if you hadn't been sort of scuba certified and had that experience, maybe you wouldn't have been invited to go out, even if it was your dad, right? He wants to get the research done. <laughs> so, um, right. So just take take the experiences as they come. And, um, yeah, that's, that's a really good advice. Um, we had a question from the audience about um, pollution. So has there been any discussion about how pollution is affecting marine life um, and if environmental pollution will be a factor when deciding protected status of various marine life? Thank you for that question. That is uh, very, very interesting. And yes, um, a lots of different types of marine pollution are being taken into account. We are looking at the effect of oil spills on these species. We're looking at the effect of plastic pollution. These are filter feeding species. So they eat, they swallow anything that is small enough to go through their throat, trapped in their gills, and then goes down their throat. So marine pollution, tiny microplastics are definitely, definitely concerning for us, which is why now with the blood samples, we're also looking uh, for evidence of plastics in their bloodstream to see just how likely they are to be affected by this. Um, so that's that's definitely something that we're looking at. Um, and then the second part of the question was what deciding, exactly how, how does it go into deciding the the status. deciding protection status? I'm not exactly sure how this works. Uh, we could talk to Simon Pierce, who works in, uh, who has done the assessment for the IUCN Red List. He's an amazing partner that works with us from the Marine Megafauna Foundation. Uh, so he would be able to go into finer detail. But what they look at, from what I understand, is they look at their rates of decline and what all the impacts are. 
and with this new prevalent impact, which is changing our world's oceans, I'm sure they take that into consideration. Yes. Right. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to take in. I mean, the the impacts that you highlighted in the beginning of your presentation are it's not everything, right? Um, so it's um, there's a lot to take in. I'm sure it takes a lot of effort, a lot of research, a lot of time to to kind of push it all together and come out with a result um, on uh, on a protected status or not, right? Or what even what level of protected status, right? Um, so so I know that you guys you shared a lot of new and upcoming research, um, the ultrasound <laughs> things, uh, research looks really fun. Um, uh, so where do you see the, this project going next? You know, if, if you were offered a blank check, right, to, to keep the project going, to expand it, to make it better, what would you, what would you do? How would you, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not writing a blank check, by the way. It's someone out there, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I hope that someone out there is listening. Um, <laughs> but basically, oh, there's so much if we had a blank check like that. That just, yeah, that's that would be our wildest dream. Um, what we would do if we had that? Well, we want to work a lot more uh, with the connection between mainland Ecuador and Galapagos. So we want to move the work that we're doing both with the ultralights. Keep doing that in Galapagos but we also want to do that on mainland Ecuador. So we want to see exactly what's happening there. If those whale sharks are the same ones we're seeing here, where they move off from there, because usually once our whale sharks reach there, we lose the tags, the tracks. So we'd love to connect that bit. We'd love, love, love to have submarines to be able to go down and maybe see how they're using seamounts around Darwin Island, around the Galapagos Archipelago, to be able to see exactly what they're doing down there. Who knows, maybe they're pupping in seamount. So this would be, uh, yeah, part of our wildest dreams. An and ROV then we'd situation. like to expand yeah. a lot more on yes, our ROV or real submarines. Like, I'd love to go down and see all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, Whenever you get that submarine, please give me a do. call. I want to go too. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. <laughs> and then the education side of things. We'd love to expand our education program, get more people working on this a part the part of education outreach awareness we definitely yeah there's you can never work on that enough so yeah what of that well speaking to that end and this will be our, our last question before we wrap up for the evening but um you know speaking to that that education and conservation message um what what could a, a member of the general public let's say i'm, I'm not a scientist i'm 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 not a maybe i'm a diver maybe not just the general public, how, how can I get involved in shark conservation overall, ocean conservation, or specifically with whale sharks? How can I get involved in helping? There is so much every single citizen of the world can do for conservation without being a scientist. Like you don't have to have a biology degree to be able to help in conservation. And a lot of it has to do with our day-to-day -day habits what we eat, we know, have to know exactly what we're eating, where, where it came from. Because a lot of times we get served a fish on our plate, we don't know what fish it is, we don't know how it was caught, and we don't know what it was caught with. And that's one of the biggest problems we're having in the ocean, overfishing, use of non-selective arts. We need to know exactly how, how this is being used. So becoming a mindful consumer, then reducing use of one use plastics helps not only whale sharks, but marine life and planet life in general. So reducing your use of one use plastics to just being a mindful human being is, is huge. And then if you are a scuba diver and you have the opportunity to go out to these amazing places and you do go diving, provide these images, not only of whale sharks, photo ID works for whales, works for turtles, works for rays, provide these images on these platforms for scientists to use that's always incredibly, incredibly helpful. And then for any of you, there are always activist projects in the area where you might live. So joining coastal cleanups or joining this kind of webinar and then spreading this information to friends and family, all of that helps create awareness. So that, those are just a few things that come to mind right now as to how every single one of us can help. Yeah, that's, that's really all great, really uh, information and things you can do in your everyday life. Um, sustainable seafood is, is a huge part of that, right? So, um, and, and that's something that everyone can do is looking looking at where things come from, right? Responsible sources. There's a lot of really good 
um, information out there. Um, the Seafood Watch from the Monterey Bay Aquarium has a really great app. Um, Save Our Seas Foundation has a whole host of information on their website as well to um, look at the conservation of different species of sharks and everything like this as well. So awesome. Well, that's amazing. Well, it sounds uh, like you, you're incredibly busy and <laughs> um, thank you for taking the time to, to be with us tonight, sharing your awesome experiences and your images and videos of those amazing whale sharks. Um, maybe, maybe one of our, um, our, our guests tonight will be able to, to join sometime, go to the Galapagos and see um, these amazing creatures um, live and in person. Uh, but so thank you very much, Sophia, for, for joining us tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much, Lance, and thank you to all of you guys for joining and being here tonight with us. So just before I let you guys go, I just want to make sure I share um, next time. So our next meeting is coming up very soon. Um, we will be presenting um, on Thursday, this coming Thursday, um, with a new series um, with um, postdoctoral researcher from Florida National Uni University, uh, Dr. Andrea Beal will be joining us. Um, her project is focusing all about lemon sharks um, and the genetic effects of pollution um, in the Bahamas and how pollution is affecting lemon sharks there. Um, so join us again, Thursday, this coming Thursday, two days from today, um, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. ish, right? Um, for our uh, wonderful session then. Thank you all very much for attending tonight. I certainly appreciate you all sticking around to the very end. And again, thank you to Sophia for gracing us with her presence and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.